this week, I've just been thinking about, I broke my phone, it's okay. But I've just been just thinking about this last week and how the last time that I was here was the day that I moved in with Paul and Barb and now here we are four months and a couple weeks later and it's just been really cool thinking about this Saturday and how Barb was going to lead intercession and then right after her I was going to come up to be able to preach to you guys and not even just with today but the last time that I was standing up here was for youth group on Thursday night and for those of you who don't know this Thursday night Paul actually came and spoke to the youth group which was just such a great experience if you have teenagers be sure to ask them about that but it's just Amazing to see what God does. So the shirt I'm wearing today, it says, God sets the lonely in families. And I don't think I realized how much I missed living with a family until I moved in with Paul and Barb. Because we just realized that all these places that, you know, we think, all right, you know what, this is just what I've been used to the last six years. This is what I know. And then when God gives you such a beautiful gift, your heart just becomes overwhelmed. And so I've just been so thankful for, for their love and for their generosity, not just with me, but even with being able to share them with you guys, being able to share Paul with them on Thursday night. And Paul and Barb has come to you to youth group before to talk about World Vision. And then just thinking about all the families that we are a part of. We all have families that we are born into. But then God places us all in so many different families. Think about the, the jobs that we have, the communities that we are part of. Even in this last year, even this week, again, preparing to preach, I've been able to share my preparation, share about City of Refuge with some of the other families that God has placed me in, such as the police department. Just earlier today, I was riding around in our giant police truck delivering food to our families in Burlington City, and I got to spend the day with three officers, and they were asking about my sermon tonight and they were giving me encouragement for this tonight and even in this week too with school being able to share about that I'm going to be preaching with some of the teachers and the guidance counselors and the school nurse I work with and that they weren't just like oh whatever that's cool but they wanted to know about it they wanted to hear about it they want to see the link so they can watch the video and so I just want to encourage all of you just to think about the families that God has placed you in and to not brush any of them off or, or to write any of them off because maybe they cause you frustration because let's be real sometimes our our biological families cause us frustration so why would we not expect the same from these other families that God places us in but each family that God places you in is an opportunity for Christ to yes. work in and through you for Jesus to be shared maybe for the first time if not for Jesus to be continued to be talked about to be preached about to be Share together so that you, we can all continue to grow. So, just want to encourage you with that, but let's, we can move into our scripture for tonight. We're actually going to be looking at Daniel 3, 16 through 29, and Exodus 17, 10 through 13. I'm just going to read from Daniel for right now. So, Daniel 3, 16 through 29 says, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we, whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their, their pants, turbans, robe, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. They replied, Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any other god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and their homes will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue us like this. Amen. Now, if you spent any time in Sunday school as a child, chances are you have heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe you experienced the flannel graph version, and you, maybe you were the one that got to move the little characters across the board as the teacher read the story. Or maybe you grew up around the same time as me and you got to see the VeggieTales portrayal of this story starring Mr. Nezer as the owner of the chocolate factory and Bob, Larry, and Junior Asparagus as Rap, Shack, and Benny. Maybe you even know how to sing the Bunny song, which you can ask Paul and Barb. I did play that song this week. <laughs> no matter where you have first heard this story, chances are it was told with the message of not compromising your beliefs not giving in to peer pressure, and celebrating that the lives of these three Hebrew children were saved. Now, none of these things are a bad message at all, and they are actually all very important lessons to learn and to even celebrate. But I can't help but wonder if we've been missing the most important part of this story. We talk about it often here at Cork, but we say that our purpose is to glorify Christ and from that place of glorifying him, lives are redeemed. God is good to us. Amen. And God does provide for us. And miracles do happen. And we should rejoice in these things. We should tell each other these stories. We should celebrate them. Amen. And so I don't want to make light of these stories of how we've experienced God or how we see him move in our lives. But I think we make ourselves the center of these stories far too often, when in fact these stories are not just about us at all. Amen. Henry Blackaby writes, what is God's will for my life is not the best question to ask. I think the right question is simply, what is God's will? In other words, what is God, what is it that God is purposing where I am? Once I know what God is doing, then I know what I need to do. The focus needs to be on God and his purpose, not my life. So before we can move on to see the purpose of our text tonight, we need to see how we get to the point of being able to recognize God's will. To be able to see what he is doing around us and join him in that. In the original Hebrew, Shadrach was actually named Hananiah, which means God is gracious. Meshach was Mishael, which means who is God, and Abednego was Azariah, which means God has helped me. When they were taken to Babylon, they were given Babylonian names. And so from here on out, that is what I am going to refer to them as, rather than the names that they were given by their Babylonian captors. So these three guys, they knew God. They did not know just, they didn't just know about him, but they had a relationship with him. And that is the key the relationship. Think about the relationships that you have. Aren't there certain things that you will only do for certain people? Tasks that you only do, not because you enjoy them, but because of the relationship you have with the person. For me, I do not like waking up early. I love to be able to sleep in. I love to be able to get as much of sleep as possible, which doesn't happen very often. So if I wake up early for you on a day that I could have slept in, it is because my love for you is greater than my desire and sometimes even my need to sleep. And so how great of a relationship did Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah have with Christ that they were willing to disobey the king's decree and were even willing to be thrown 
into the fiery furnace knowing that that would mean death. There was no promise that Christ was going to save them from the fire. They knew that he could because God can do anything. But they also knew that he might not save them. Because if God always rescued those who were true to him, then Christians would not need faith. And you'd have this long line of people who want to know this God that saved you from every hardship, that saved you from every illness, disease, every battle, every fire that you find yourself in. There would be no need for faith. But they were confident in Christ, and they knew that they were loved and that he loved them in return. And they knew that they had been given this gift of eternal life that not even a fire or a king could take away from them. These three guys were martyrs. Martyrs com Martyr comes from the Greek word for witness, which is defined as one who chooses to suffer death rather than to deny Jesus Christ or his work. One who bears testimony to the truth of what he has seen or heard or knows, as in a witness in the court of justice. One who sacrifices something very important to further the kingdom of God. One who endures severe or constant suffering for their Christian witness. So they live their lives as witnesses of Christ. That is what makes them martyrs. It's not just the fact that, that they face death or that they almost died. Because witness can be defined as evidence or proof. So their lives were evidence of Christ. Amen. Proof of his character. Proof of his existence. So I want us to just take a pause for a moment. What are our lives a witness of? What are we telling the people around us? What are we telling the people in our families? And like I mentioned before we started, God has placed us in so many different families. There's the families that we're born into, but then there's the families that we have at work, at school, in the communities. What are we witnesses to, to these families? Are they asking us questions about the faith that we have? Do they even know that we are followers of Christ? Do they know that there is something different about us? Because often with martyrs, we speak of those who have died for their faith. But like I said, that is only part of it. Martyrdom is a way of living that comes from a relationship with Christ. Because no one decides in a moment that they're willing to die for someone else. That comes from a relationship. Right. Parents, you defend your children and you would do anything for your children because of a relationship that you have with them, because you love them so much. And so that is how it is for us with Christ. We have a relationship with him. These Christians that we read about who do die for their faith, they didn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, today I'll die for Jesus. But rather, that is a decision that they made long ago because of how they have decided to live their lives. And so if Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah desired their earthly lives more than they desired Christ, then they could have avoided the fire. They had a way out, so to speak, because they could have denied Christ, rejected him, and avoided the furnace altogether. But that's not what they did. They desired to glorify Christ and see others redeemed in all that they did and all that they said. And we hear other stories of those who have made similar decisions. I've been reading the book Jesus Freaks by Voice of the Martyrs in DC Talk. It is a book full of stories of those who stood for Jesus. And one of the stories that stuck out to me was this story. It's called The Thundering Legion. And it was 40 Roman soldiers in AD 320 who believed firmly in Jesus and refused to make offerings to Roman gods. They were offered money, they were offered military honors, and when that didn't work, then they were, they were threatened with torture, they were even threatened with death. And yet, none of these 40 men were willing to reject Jesus, to deny Jesus. And so they were given a death sentence. They were ordered to strip down naked and to stand in the middle of a frozen lake. There's another story of a man named Payam and his family. Now, this family lived in Cambodia in the 1970s, and they came to a point where they knew they only had a couple hours to live because the communist soldiers had rounded them up for execution. 
They were even made to, to dig their own graves. So parents and children together dug what would become their grave. And before they were going to be killed, they were allowed a moment to hold hands together and pray to prepare themselves for death. In all these stories, we see Christians who were faced with death, and the Roman soldiers, and Hagem and his family did actually die. And so, if we make these stories just about the Christians, then why did these others die, but God saved Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah? Why do Christians still die today for their faith? Or even just put that aside for a moment, why do Christians still die from illness, from tragic accidents, while other Christians survive. And what if Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah did end up dying in the fire? Do we no longer tell their story? I don't know the answers to all these questions, and I know that some of them are very difficult questions that some people really do struggle with. And at some point in our lives, maybe we find ourselves one of those people who struggle with why does God save some and not the others. And so I don't mean to make light of these questions, but we must go back to what is God's will for Christ to be glorified and for people to be redeemed. So now let's take a closer look at how all these stories end, including our text. Because it is much more than earthly life or death. For the Thundering Legion, as they continued to stand in the middle of the lake freezing, the governor tried to further tempt them by setting up hot baths on the shoreline and offering them, just deny Christ and then you can get into this bath and be warm. Out of the 40 soldiers, one did give in. But 40 men still died for their faith. Because you see, when one of the guards that was on the shoreline saw the man desert, he himself threw off his clothes and ran to join the naked ones on the ice. Voice of the Martyr writes, some call it the mystery of martyrdom. Why well, would seeing 39 believers who are willing to die for their, their faith inspire a highly trained soldier in the prime of his life to join them in death? It seems so for, foreign to our modern way of thinking. It is amazing to see how God works through these tragic situations to call more people to himself. For Ham and his family, as they were praying before their death, one of his young sons leapt up and disappeared into the nearby forest. Ham convinced the soldiers, though, to let him try and call his own son back before they stormed the forest themselves. So as a father, he shouted, Think, my son, can stealing a few more days of life as a fugitive in the forest compare to joining your family here around a grave, but forever in paradise? Weeping, the boy returned. And Hagem told the soldiers that they were ready to go. They were ready to die. But none of the soldiers would kill them because of what they had just witnessed. They were eventually shot, but by a soldier who had not witnessed the prayer, who had not witnessed the father calling out to his son and the son returning. And finally, we have our three Hebrews from our text today. They were thrown into a furnace that was so hot that the soldiers who threw them in died, but yet they did not perish. And in fact, a fourth person was seen in the fire with them, and they were saved. But we can't stop there. We read in our text, Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. 
They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any god except their god. Therefore, so therefore, because of what this was said, the following is about to happen. I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. So because Nebuchadnezzar saw their faith, he saw what they were willing to do for their God, Nebuchadnezzar recognized God's hand, and he praised Christ. As I've been preparing for this, I've been doing some different readings on this passage. And a lot of the readings seem to just kind of blow off this part and say, oh, well, Nebuchadnezzar was not making a commitment to Christ alone. He did not tell the people to throw away all the other gods, but he just added Christ to the list. So what? Not that those things are not important, not that we're supposed to worship a bunch of different gods. But why is that our focus? Why is that what we see what Nebuchadnezzar was doing? Because we miss the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was recognizing Christ's hand. He was praising our God. So why is there not more rejoicing in what God did through these Hebrews to reach the heart of Nebuchadnezzar? We made salvation so much about this one magical moment when we finally go from death to eternal life in one moment. In one moment, we, are, we think that we walk away forever from our old sinful ways, and now we're completely new, and we don't go back to any of those. And while that does happen, and there is a point when we have to make a decision, will we follow Christ or not? We have to remember that there is a journey to salvation. Just like we talk about that there is a lifelong journey of sanctification, there is a journey that we have all went on till we got to that point of salvation. There is a journey that the people that we love, the people that we care about, honestly, even the people that we may despise, are on until they get to that point where they make that decision of, will I follow Christ or not? And most of us can attest, when we make that decision, our life the next day probably doesn't look that much different than it did the day before. But we are just aware of such greater truth. We know who God is. And so then we get, begin the work of sanctification. Then we begin the work of having our lives transformed. So why don't we recognize this with Nebuchadnezzar? Why do we expect him to all of a sudden throw out everything that he knew since he was born just because he now praised God? There's a work that is being done. Christ pursues us. 1 John 4, 19 says that we love him because he first loved us. Too many people think that God and his love are like us and our love. When our hearts were filled with hatred for the person who has offended us, we must see change in that offender to be reconciled with them. So we assume that God is the same way. For God to be reconciled with us, he must see some kind of change in us. But that's not so. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still offenders, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the unrelenting, unconditional, personal, and powerful love of God obtained reconciliation for sinners to himself, even when we were sinners. Even when we weren't asking for it. In other words, Sinners were reconciled to God at the cross. Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. So what if this story is not about God saving the lives of the three Hebrews, but the depth of his love for Nebuchadnezzar? What if our trials and difficulties are not about us making it through to the other side, but about those around us who Christ desires to show his glory through us so that we can see them come to redemption. Because remember, God is always at work around us. And any time we hear someone speak about Christ, whether we deem it positive or negative, it still means that Christ is stirring something up in their heart. 
Because why would people even speak negatively about a God that they did not think existed? We don't talk poorly about people who we've made up. So there's something going on in their hearts that is causing them to say that. That's God working. So let us rejoice in the fact that Nebuchadnezzar saw God's hand in the fire and praised him. Let us rejoice that even the legion of soldiers, even Hagar and his family's final moments on earth, that Christ was glorified. For the soldiers, redemption happened right in front of them. For Ham and his family, we do not know what became of the soldiers that witnessed the moments before their death. The soldiers who refused to shoot them. But we can be confident that seeds were planted and that Christ was glorified. So do not write people off because they're not following your timeline of salvation for them. I know that it is hard to continue to endure, to pray for those that we love, because we want them to have what we have. We want them to know Jesus, but we can't put our timelines on them. God didn't put his timeline on us. He looked at our hearts, he knows our hearts, and he works according to our hearts. So rejoice when you see God working, even if it's such a tiny thing. Rejoice. Because God is always working. And it is a beautiful thing to think about Christ being glorified and lives being saved, even in our hardships. Because we are called to live lives that are holy, just like Christ. Which holy doesn't mean live this absolutely perfect life and that you can't ever mess up or make a mistake. But holy means completely other. So those who are in the world, but not of it, being different than those around us, those who live in such a way that cause people to ask questions, those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, those who have responded like Simon Peter in John 6, verses 67 through 68, that Jesus turned to the twelve and he asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And so, again, it's beautiful to see that God can be glorified in our hardships. It's beautiful to know that lives can be saved in our hardships. But that is not an easy life to live. And I often say to myself, in these moments of frustration, even in these moments of pain, in these moments of loneliness, moments when I feel like all the promises that I thought I heard God say have come to a standstill, moments when I feel like I cannot see any sign of hope. As a reminder, I say to myself, but where will I go? When people ask, what is the timeline for our building, and I do not have an answer, I say, but where else would we go? Meaning, this is where God has led us, and in a moment for us, he made it possible to buy this building. So why would we leave when we know that this is where God is, has already been glorified, and he's currently being glorified, and he will be glorified? So it may not be our timeline, but where else would we go? Why would we want anything else if this is where God has placed us? When people ask me why, I single, or better yet, when they give me their advice of how I can find somebody, how I can meet somebody, what I should be doing, what dating site I should join, I stop and I say, but where will I go? Mm -hmm. Meaning, I know I'm right where God wants me, doing as he desires for this moment in my life. So why would I leave? where God has placed me? Why would I stop doing what God has called me to do to seek my own desires? Bless them. And while I may not know the how or the when, I do not want less than God's plans because he has proven over and over again that his plans are far greater than any of my own. If I had it my way, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I wouldn't have been in Burlington for the last almost 10 years. None of this was part of my plan. None of this is what I would have chosen for myself. 
But standing here now, 10 years later, I wouldn't trade any of it for any of the plans or ideas that I had for myself. And you may have your own unanswered questions or find yourselves in the fire and be wondering how you'll get through this. Or maybe you find yourself in a fire and you don't even know what you're supposed to do. So what do we do when we become worn out, when the weight of the fire becomes too much for us to bear? For many of us, our response is to keep pushing forward, to just suck it up and deal with it on our own, because it's our responsibility. It's our problem. It's our life to figure out. And don't get me wrong, I am all about moving forward. But what if moving forward is not meant to be done on our own? Amen. Some of us, though, might respond differently. When the weight becomes overwhelming, we retreat, we isolate, we hide away. We get stuck. We freeze. We become trapped, maybe even con controlled by our emotions. Emotions that tell us that we should be ashamed or full of guilt for the weight that we are carrying. Emotions that tell us we are alone. Emotions that tell us this is your burden to bear. But what if we are meant to embrace these burdens? What if we are meant to embrace our weakness? What if we are meant to embrace the fire? In Exodus 17, we read about the Israelites being attacked by the Malachites. They were literally under siege and had a literal battle to fight. We read, so Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hands, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses had a job to do. It was his task and his alone. It was his burden it was his fire to be in. Just as a quick aside, he had to hold his staff up. And one of my favorite stories with Moses deals with this staff. And it's when he was getting ready to go talk to Pharaoh to free the Egyptians, to free the Israelites from the Egyptians. And Moses said, but God, well, pretty much why me? I should not go. I am not the one that is qualified for this. Do not send me. And here's the list of reasons why. And God didn't shoot down his, his reasons. But God asked him, what is in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. Now, he's a shepherd, so of course he would have a staff. And there's nothing wrong with a shepherd having a staff. But for Moses, though, that staff was not just a reminder that he was a shepherd. It was a reminder as to why he was a shepherd in the first place. He was a shepherd because he had killed an Egyptian. He had to run away and leave the life that he knew, to go and be a shepherd, to go live out in the wilderness. So that staff was a reminder of, to him, his biggest failure, to him, his biggest regret, his biggest mistake. Everything that was wrong with him, he could see in that staff. But God changed that around. God said, no, your staff is what I have given you to do the job that I have called you to do. I will use this for my glory, and there will be redemption because of it. So now here we find again Moses and his staff. He has to hold up his arms with his staff in his hand for the, in order to be victory. So Moses had a job to do. It was his task and his alone. It was his burden to bear. And so as long as he held up his, his hands in intercession, the Israelites were winning the battle. But if he lowered his hands, then they began to lose. So that was just not a weight that he had on his mind, but it was a literal weight that he felt in his arms. It could not be ignored. It could not be passed off. The battle belonged to Moses. Amen. So if we were those who see Moses going through this, we might pray to Christ to give him strength. We do that for each other, right? And if we're Moses, we might ask for others, pray for strength. Pray for me to have strength. I have to do this. I have to do that. But what if Moses is meant to be not meant to be strengthened? What if we are meant to be weak? We continue to read in Exodus. Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. 
Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so they held his hands steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed, overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. It is a beautiful picture. But how often are we willing to let somebody else hold up our arms? How often are we willing to let people into our lives that intimately that they know that we are weak, that they know that we are struggling? Because if I'm being honest, I struggle with that myself. I struggle with letting other people in. I struggle with admitting that I am overwhelmed or that the weight is just too much for me alone. I believe the lies that tell me I must do this alone, that this is my battle to fight, that I need to just push through the fire by my own strength. As Christians, though, this is not the life we are called to live. We do have battles that we must fight, but nowhere do we read in the Bible that we must do it alone. Whether we are looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament, we see stories of God's people coming alongside of each other, devoting themselves to each other. Aaron and her were devoted to Moses. They knew they could not just stand on the sidelines, but they also knew that they could not take Moses' spot, so they came alongside of him. They held up his arms. They did not let him stand alone. In Acts, we read about the first church. We read that they devoted themselves to God's word, God's people, and prayer. They shared everything they had. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. The first church entered each other's lives. They shared their burdens, and no one was left to battle alone. So again, we see this beautiful picture. One we would all love to be part of. But it must start with us being willing to share our own burdens. Being willing to face the fire with those that God has put in our lives. So who are your Aaron and her? Who are the people Christ has placed in your life to carry your burdens with you? To remind you that you do not fight alone. To show you that even in your weakness, you are loved and not forgotten. Being a martyr, being a witness of Jesus, is not easy. But once we have come to know him, once we have experienced him, then where else, where we, will we go? Because I promise you that Christ will be glorified and lives will be redeemed through your life, through your hardship, even through the ways that God provides for you. But I also promise you that it will not be easy. But once again, I just want to remind you that you do not have to go through it alone. Devote yourself to God's word. Devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to God's people. Find your Aaron and her. Fight your battles. Face your fires. And see Christ glorified. And see people redeemed. God, we just thank you tonight that you did not create us to be alone. That you created us to not just have a relationship with you, but to have a relationship with each other. To be in fellowship with each other. To fight battles together. That there is no situation, that there is no difficulty that you have called us to deal with on our own. So God, I pray for courage tonight. I pray for the courage to share those deep places of our hearts, those places that have been broken, those places that we have been trying to fix for so long on our own. Those places that we have just almost given up on and buried under the rug and just hope that they'll disappear. God, I pray for the courage to deal with those places, even to deal with them starting tonight. 
that we would look around and to see how you are working around us, that we would see the people that you have placed in our lives to be like Aaron, to be like her, to hold our arms up. That we would know that we are so greatly loved by you that we can trust our heart, not just to you, but to the people that you have given us for such a time as this. And God, I just thank you for all the lives that have already been saved because of hardships. I thank you for every life that has been saved because somebody was willing to, to die for you. So we thank you for our Christian brothers and sisters who have had a faith so great that even when faced with death, they cannot deny it. God, I pray that that would stir something in us to want to know you even deeper, to want to pursue you even more as much as you have pursued us. So God, I just thank you for your love today. God, I thank you that you are always at work around us. And God, I thank you that you have never given up on us. You have never given up on those that we love. So God, I pray that we would be those who endure, that we would be those who endure through our hardships, that we would be those who endure through our prayers of salvation for others, and that we would be witnesses of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Amanda. Um, we're gonna we're gonna close tonight by by basically doing that thing that Amanda just uh, preached to us about and talked about. Um, many of you that those of you who are here regularly, I'm sure you noticed that Veronica wasn't here um, leading worship with us tonight. Um, Veronica and her family are right now gathered around her grandmother as she is being prepared to be gathered home, not just to the Lord but by the Lord. Uh, she's been on hospice for a little while and. Um, and She's, she's approaching that the end of this life so that she can begin the one that has been planned for her. And I absolutely love the way that the Old Testament in particular talks about death. It says over and over again, and he was gathered to his fathers. We don't gather ourselves. Someone comes to gather us yes, amen. to himself. Amen. And so tonight we're going to pray for the Pasquale family as... Their grandmother, Jesus, is coming to gather her to himself, to receive her to himself. But we've all lost someone that we love, and so we know that while we are not grieving for those that are receiving their great reward, we are grieving for our hearts as we endure great loss. And so would you join me tonight as we pray for the Pasquale family, especially for Veronica and Emily and Gabe, for the grandchildren, and for Vince, as this is his mother. And let's just, let's just hold their arms up tonight. Um, and, and we don't know if tonight will be the night, but it will be within the next hours, uh, one way or the other. And we want to make sure that we stand around them and that we hold their hearts um, as they trust God to receive their dearest, dearest love. So join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that you are the lover of our soul. God, I thank you tonight, and I thank you for the word that you spoke through Amanda, and I thank you for the word that you have placed in Amanda. God, I thank you tonight that Jesus met, that Jesus was present in the fire. But I thank you that he didn't just come rescue them, but he was there with them. That he walked about the fire with those three young men, which means that even if it had been their time to die in that fire, he would have been in that fire with them. That he walks with us and he talks with us and he tells us that we are his own. And so tonight, God, I thank you that the, that the Pasquale's grandmother belongs to you. I thank you that she has, she has given herself to you and you have given yourself for her. And so I thank you that in these next hours that you will gather her to your heart because it will be your pleasure. It will be your joy. It will be that moment when she sees you as you are. And we rejoice in that, God, that the crown of life is appointed for all of us who believe. But at the same time, God, we mourn with those who mourn, knowing that as Barb prayed tonight, they shall be comforted. 
And so I pray that even at this moment in the Pascal's house, that your presence, that they would be so aware of your presence, that it would be manifest, that it would be tangible, that they would be so aware that you are near them, that even in their grief they would know peace, that even in their grief they would know joy, that they would experience you as you catch their tears in your bottle and as you come near and stay near to the broken heart. So God, I pray for each member of the family that they would know that even as you are gathering their grandmother to yourself, that you are holding them near to your heart. Father, I pray for all of those in this room and who may be watching that are grieving for any reason tonight. May we know that you are the God who is close to the brokenhearted. That you are the God who grieves with us even as you rejoice over us. And so tonight, God, may we not believe that grief is a weakness, that it separates us from God, that it is some action of the flesh, but may we know that grief is an act of love. And so I pray that as we're grieving, that we would remember that even Jesus wept in his grief. And may we know that he's interceding for us, that he is holding us together because he will not allow us to fall apart. And so God, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for every Aaron and every her who doesn't just pray, but who holds. I thank you for every Moses that has a task to do, but knows he cannot go do it alone. So I pray for us tonight, that in our weakness, that we would make sure we're surrounded, and that as we surround each other, that we would make sure that our arms are lifted. Thank you that we are one body of many members. May we not just be joined to you, may we be joined to one another. Thank you, Jesus, for being our intercessor. Thank you for being our comforter. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being our brother and our king. We trust you tonight, and we ask you to have your way. Father, as we go from this place, I pray that we would go in confidence of your presence, that we would go in confidence of your love, that we would go in confidence that you are leading and you are guiding. And so I pray tonight that your rod and your staff, they would comfort us. Father, fight off our enemies and correct us where we go our own way. I pray tonight that as we go, that we would take every step for your glory and that we would allow you to use us to redeem those that we will come in contact with. And so I pray, yes, comfort our hearts. Yes, strengthen our weaknesses. But save souls, God, through every part of our lives, through our greatest days and our worst days, through our victories and our defeats. Save souls. And may we believe, may we believe that you are good and your love endures forever. God, thank you that Nebuchadnezzar mattered enough for you to show him your son. Use our lives to show your son to those who matter so much to your heart. Let Jesus be glorified and let souls be redeemed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's been great to have you with us. If you need prayer, please ask someone. Um, and otherwise, please spend a little time in fellowship together. God bless you and see you next week.